love one another. A and so uh, that component of love one another also includes self. Uh, how can we love, how can we take care of everyone else if we're not taking care of ourselves either? Uh, so family is also included in that part of health, uh, taking care of one another. Um, one of the things that I tell my uh, my congregation and any time I do this is uh, when my spouse has to come to me and ask me, do I need to set up an appointment to see you? That's a clear indication that the balance of serving one's own health and be, uh, and serving the congregation or whatever you serve, whatever capacity you serve is not balanced. And so um, it literally took him asking me that question because I was dedicating most of my time uh, to the church and the church family. And I was neglecting or there was un unbalance in my in and serving my own family as well. Uh, so from my perspective, the pastor's perspective, uh, you know, it's the relationship with spouse, relationship with our, our own pastors, the conference minister, spiritual director, other pastors, relationship with the church moderator, relationship with our own doctors, our own mental health providers, if we have one, relationship with our church partners and members, and relationship with, and I'll let you add into that. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to our chaplain. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I was wondering, some of you I know better than others. Um, I was wondering, those of you who are there, what kind of ministry context are you all serving in? Um, where, what might be giving you burnout or not? <laughs> uh, where do you serve, just so we know? I, I serve in the UU capacity now, um, but my ministry that I've been focusing on since day one has been radical self-care, uh, taking on the oxygen before others. Um, and I, 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 I like this ministry of um, helping others to pass on, but assisting them in loving themselves as they close their eyes for the last time, knowing that you are loved regardless of what you've been told. So it's heavy. So it's very important to take care of yourself and watch your, your mental wellness. Yeah. And you know, one thing I think about a lot um, as a chaplain, and I wonder, I feel like this probably applies to congregational positions too, is um, I think a lot of times those of us who, it's our job to encourage other people to have self-care. It's our job to encourage other people to tend their souls. Um, it becomes a little bit of a, what's the saying? Like the cobbler's children have no shoes situation. Um, where we're always encouraging others to, and maybe feel, don't feel like we have permission to do that for ourselves, or maybe even feel a little bit of like guilt and shame about needing it too. Um, so I think part of why this is an important thing to name and talk about is, uh, cause I, I think if we forget that we are also human, like that gets rough. Right. Um, and I'll just say for me in a, uh, chaplaincy context, my main ministry now is I work in the hospital setting and I actually went back to the hospital setting, uh, full time a few weeks before COVID hit a few weeks before the lockdown was the timing wow. on for wow. some, mm -hmm. um, spirit reason that I can't quite make sense of. Uh, and so I will say I had done some chaplaincy before that, but most of it has been COVID and, you know the continuing COVID reality. Um, I will say that I think a lot of us, everyone that worked in the hospital, like mm -hmm. felt this reality that we were working in this intense experience that we didn't think we'd ever, I mean, I'll say when I went through CPE, I didn't envision anything like that ever happening. Um, and I know those of you in congregational ministry that suddenly were like, oh, and this Sunday, you know, last Sunday we had this lovely, gathering in person and next this Sunday, like now I'm planning what Lent and Easter and everything's going to look like uh, on Zoom. I know it was a reality you couldn't have expected too. Um, and I think that the fact of the matter is whatever that shift looked like for us. Um, I mean, I can say in the hospital setting and I, I know from people in congregational ministry, this is true for you too. Uh, it's still not back to normal, right? 
like what normal is has permanently changed, not just in our lives, but also in our work. Um, and I know in the healthcare setting, we really went from dealing with the immediate crisis and the fear and the extreme trauma and moral distress of um, like the early COVID to a lot of that continuing with um, now like budget crises and staff shortage and the stressors just keep continuing. Um, so I just wanna name that, that I think that for a lot of us, there was an I for all name for me, there was an idea that, oh, at some point this is all gonna stop and we're gonna be able to take a breath, right? And I think maybe one of the things we've learned now is um, we need to claim our space to take that breath. It's not going to just be offered to us. Um, and one of the other things I was thinking about that as I was preparing for this was that there was a thing that got us through maybe that early, that early wave and that early um, trauma of like early COVID. And a lot of the things that got us through was like adrenaline, right? Um, and was maybe that early kind of enthusiasm for mission that you get early on when you're going through a hard thing. And one of the things I'm sitting with now is maybe the thing that got us through at some point isn't going to be what gets us through now, right? Um, and I mean, whatever it was that got you through those hard times, like God bless it, right? It got you through. There's no problem with it, but maybe we need other tools now. Um, so when I'm thinking about those tools, one of the things that comes to mind for me are like, what are what are our inner resources? Um, and when I think of my inner resources, I think of kind of what brought me into this work, um, being able to reflect on that, um, being able to take time and remember what brought me to this work and reflect on, is that what keeps me in this work or is what keeps me in this work changed? Um, I don't know if anyone feels like they wanna share what brought them into whatever work that they do, but I think that that's one way to tap into inner resources if you feel like you want to share. If I could just add something, and I, I promise I'll be done. Please. I'm from Jersey. We talk a lot. I'm sorry. I'll be done. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But what I wanted to say was with regard to the burden that we carry, and it is a burden of ministering, being advocates, whatever that is for you. When 2020 hit, because we were separate and apart and we were in our spaces alone, we were not only dealing with the challenges that care seekers were bringing to us, a lot of us had to sit with our demons from our own lives and our own childhoods and our own marriages and our own relationships and jobs. And we were forced to mourn losing the things, the parts of us that needed to die so that we could move forward and grow. So we're juggling our death, right? Our tower moments, and also trying to hold on to this world that looked like it was slipping through our fingers. And um, what got me for, through, and I'm gonna say in all honesty, um, I'm a ritual person. I had to become closer to my indigenous spirituality with regard to my ancestors and the candles and all the things. And also too, meant I had a therapist. I'm not ashamed of needing that for depression and anxiety because 2020 was that place where ministers were afraid to say, I have suicidal ideation because of the things, the old stuff that came back, right? That we thought we got rid of. You're carrying your mother's luggage, your dad's luggage, your ancestors' luggage. You're trying to figure out how to juggle your luggage. So therapy was a big thing for me. And I feel that uh, therapists and uh, mental health workers are angels that the universe has put into our space. We're not the old church anymore. The old church that told us this can all be prayed away. It's about imbalances, chemical imbalances and yeah. organic um, um, things that have influenced us. So that's what, that's what, um, got me through and, and I'm done, but I, I, I hear, and I understand that we all are sometimes suffering silently. Yeah. yeah. Lenny, you were going to say something? Yeah. Uh, well, I, um, I'm kind of in a unique situation. I passed, I was associate pastor in Washington, DC after a seminary. And then I pastored a church in Decatur, Georgia for 28 years. And, um, and I was an over -functioner. 
Um, and uh, but after 18 years of being a senior pastor, uh, I suggested to the church and it was resisted and embraced by different people. We set up a non-hierarchical model uh, where uh, we called another pastor, a woman, and uh, she and I had one job description. So suddenly, instead of me being the senior pastor and having an associate pastor who basically did education and youth, we had one job description, which meant I was doing youth work in my 50s again. And children's work, we we shared everything and all the public ministry was equal. So, but what happened is I went from, I basically cut the preaching in half uh, because I was no longer, you know, so that changed my ministry the last 10 years. And then she stayed on and uh, is the pastor now, has been the pastor for seven years and then called another pastoral member after her. Uh, but but after being retired for several years, uh, one of my former parishioners, who was a chaplain, uh, asked me about doing part, doing on-call for the chaplains. And I did on-call and then part-time and then an interim chaplaincy. And they invited me to uh, take a full-time job in March. So I'm now at 72, unretired. And I will say this, at 72, I probably, from all the years of not taking care of myself, I'm pretty good at finally taking care of myself. And what helps me about chaplaincy, unlike the pastorate, is unless I'm on call every fifth weekend, that it's primarily eight to five. And I, you know, <laughs> it, and it, at 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 um, uh, you know, and, and pastoring was, you know, it was all all the times, you know, seven days a week, kind of if somebody called you. So, um, so I'm I'm just kind of enjoying it. I will probably have my second retirement when it becomes meaningful. But I'm just really loving. Mm -hmm. I'm loving being with people, at liminal moments, and not arguing about what the church budget should be or interpersonal conflicts or uh, my my former colleague will call me and say I'm in a text me and say I'm in a two hour budget meeting in case you have any nostalgia about coming back to pastoring so <laughs> so one of the things that I hear is this idea of spiritual practices. And I've, many of us learned this in seminary. I remember learning this, and Daniel might remember this idea of journaling but as a spiritual practice, this idea of uh, exercising and hiking and swimming. And Now, some people add this idea of reading and writing as a spiritual practice, but I was thinking about this, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear what you all think about this, is if you're reading something that has to do with work, that really isn't a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. That is that is work, right. <laughs> right? So if you're reading something to do your sermon, you think that's a spiritual practice? No, that's you're doing that for work. <laughs> something so, that is out of the the work kind of thing, a book that you always wanted to read just because you wanted to read it. Uh, again, prayer, meditation, and yoga, and and family time is a spiritual practice. Um, and, and so we we really need to dedicate that and say, and be able to usurp our boundaries because our congregations will take every time and then some uh, that you can give them. Uh, and so uh, it is really important to set up uh, boundaries. So what do you all think about those spiritual practices or what do you do as a spiritual practice? Can I just say, I know you've had, oh, sorry. I know Daniel's had his hand up too. So I don't know if we want to oh. offer space for that. Uh, thank you. Daniel, I, go well, for it. I, thank you. Um, I, uh, well, for me, one of the things that have been challenging um, these last few months is because I've been a hospice, cha I was a hospice cha chaplain for nine years. I had honed my, my boundaries and my self care in that context really well. And I loved what Lenny was saying about the nine to five thing. When you're done, it's like, you're done. It's like, and now I'm like in my third month of being a, a 
interim pastor, the sole pastor of a church, and that stuff's going out the window because <laughs> it. I'm having to create a whole new. I mean, some of them yes, but I'm having to create a whole new thing. Whereas I can't just take my my work cell phone and turn it off and just set it aside on on my days off. I mute it and I put it aside, but I don't totally turn it off because. And also, the board knows that they can get a hold of me through my personal phone if there's like an emergency, like the church is on fire or somebody dies, and so. One of the things that I, I am seeing them struggling with um, a little bit, I mean, I have a therapist that I see on a weekly basis, which is great, is that um, reassessing and reinstituting those mm -hmm. self-care practices and finding the new boundaries and the new self-care practices that work as a parish minister, which is very different um, mm -hmm. than being a hospice chaplain, because it's like when I'm done, I'm done for the day and I don't have to worry about nobody else because somebody else can take care of it if they're on call. So, um, yeah. So that's, chaplain, that's my, that's my challenge. Yeah. That makes total sense. As a chaplain, you had like an institution that was setting those boundaries for you. And now, I mean, you're the institution on some level, you've got to send it for yourself and be the bad guy there. Jane, I just wanted to also it. say, yeah, I, I cannot advocate for someone who has suffered burnout, uh, for a while. Uh, back in my earlier days and then had to really recover uh, through just resting a lot and finding, reclaiming that which gives you joy. I think sometimes we don't even have room in our lives for joy and delight and what enchants us, you know, and even the word pleasure and fun. I mean, laughter, goodness gracious, having a little lovely glass of wine. Uh, for me, it's walking in the neighborhood park. It's going to the ocean. Those are my spiritual practices, as well as I have a spiritual director, because I'm clear all of these things. Burnout is God's way of talking to us. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're into somatic therapy, it's also your body's way of talking to you that you need something as simple as rest. Mm -hmm. And if you need something more radical, Andre Lord talks about Audrey Lord rather that rest is a radical act. Mm. Rest is a radical act of love, self-love. Mm. And I just want to address, it's a little delicate matter again, but I think it's also for me in unpacking why I felt so driven to always have to take care of others is in our puritanical history. Again, this is part of what who we are in terms of when you become a Christian or a Protestant, or I think in I can't see for all the other faiths, but certainly in our puritanical history and uh, genealogy, you know, sacrifice is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Sacrificing your own personal well-being for others, as if that was a demonstration of how godly you are. And I just want to say, I think we need to challenge that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a healthy thing to challenge that. And many of us now doing, thank you very much. I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir. But, uh, you know, uh, I had to unpack and then claim for myself, I have the right. I've also taught a, a course on caregivers. Caregivers have rights. I, I read them a list of rights they have, like, you know, the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. So caregivers have a Bill of Rights, a right to rest, a right for time out, a right to, you know, do something pleasurable or fun for yourself. At all of that. And I think, you know, ministers need to really relook at that whole thing about what does it mean to minister? Like you were saying earlier, is it just to others or how about to ourselves as well? So, so thank you, Shannon. I, I, I like that. Thank you, uh, Shannon, for putting that up. Uh, you're correct. Even Jesus went to the hills and caves uh, exactly. to go rest, right? Yeah. And I'm always hearing be like Jesus. Well, <laughs> We too need to be like Jesus and go to our heels and caves to rest. But uh, I, I too carry, like Daniel, I too carry a church cell phone. And uh, it's separate from my personal phone. But th those key people, like the moderator, know how they can get a hold of me. Uh, the church uh, uh, secretary knows how to get a hold of me if it's an emergency. They can always send me a text message, and my text message is forwarded to my email. And so I make the decision if it's a uh, an emergency or if it's not. But I also gave all my members of my church 
permission to call one another and be ministers to each other, that the pastor is not the only minister in the church. They too are ministers of the church and they, they can call one another and take care of each other as well. Uh, because when I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. I don't take my church cell phone with me on vacation. So they have to call one another and take care of each other. So, and they do that. Uh, they, they they learn to do that, but sometimes they need a, a reminder. <laughs> I love that too, because it's this idea that when you go on vacation, they're not abandoned. They're not pastorless. We're all engaged in the work of ministry and they will continue to minister to each other. One of the ministers happens to be taking a break for a week. <laughs> Yes. And, and you and you have to remember, people that don't set boundaries for themselves never understand those who have established boundaries. They they yeah. can't even comprehend that someone's saying no because they're yes people. Don't you let know, that influence you. You get your rest, your sleep, hide from your kids, your spouse, your partner, hide from the world if you need to go into the mountains and the hills. Mm -hmm. Do Which what you need to do. Yes. And, yeah. you know, that reminds me, Shannon, I think that's so true, because I think that also is a sign that when we're setting good boundaries for ourselves, it's not just ministry to ourselves, but it's ministry to others. Yeah. It's teaching others what yeah. boundaries are, and it's letting them learn maybe how to do that for themselves. Yeah. It's a very compassionate thing to do to the people we minister to. Yeah. Pastor Daniel, you were going to say something? Yeah, thank you. Um what Jade was saying reminds me of those Ignatian exercises. Um, uh, the part that says, um, where the questions of what enlivens my soul, yes, what deadens my soul. Egg, nice. You know, so what is it that we're doing to enliven our souls? What is it that we're doing to, as Jade says, gives us joy and gives us back that, uh, sense of laughter um for me i can answer that it's singing in a choir i i sing in a choir besides um mm -hmm. having uh like loving ministry but like also singing in a choir and like just mm -hmm. to have that kind of uh experience of making music with musicians that are better than me uh like it just feels so good to be surrounded by all that beauty um, and then, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to answer on a recorded thing. What about ministry deadens me? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there, there may be some things there. Uh, but, you know, those are some things we try to delegate. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say, <laughs> I think each of you have really hit on some really important uh, points and it really also to me talks about it's referring to the values we have and that sometimes you know we have had a very narrow or many of us have inherited a rather narrow view of ministry or what it is to serve others and that I remember at PSR really kind of like sometimes we would sit around at uh, what's that dining room, Dotremont or whatever, and talk about alternative forms of ministry, like it was such a radical thing. But maybe it was just really the next, you know, we needed to do that. And we are continually doing that to redefine. I put something in there about that. You know, we each have to find those places of what I call our places of refuge, you know, where we can be renewed and refreshed. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's dancing, you know, maybe it's going to the ocean, whatever it is, or singing in a choir or baking chocolate chip cookies for your grandkids. Mm. There's no one right way to do this. Mm. Christine, do you want to take us to a really short meditation that you have? I can. Yeah, we will try. So I have a meditation I do with a lot of the nurses I work with. Um, it's a variation on a meta meditation. I thought it might be a nice way to end it. Uh, I might have to abbreviate it a little, but we'll see how far we get. So I invite you to settle comfortably. Um, if you want, you can close your eyes or just soften your gaze and take a few deep breaths in at your own pace. Notice your body. How does it feel? Are you comfortable, hungry, 
tired, maybe a little fidgety after our long Zoom call. Notice any thoughts going through your head? What are the worries or hopes that you're carrying this day? And finally, take note of your emotions. Are you scared, joyful, excited? How is your spirit this day? Notice all these things about yourself and offer yourself loving kindness as you silently repeat these words. May I be happy? May I be healthy? May I be safe? May I be at peace? And now bring to mind someone you work closely with, someone that you really care for, and it could be a minister or chaplain colleague or a congregant or, or patient that just really has a big piece of your heart. Picture that person in your mind and offer them these words silently. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe. May you be at peace. I invite you now to bring to mind someone else you work with, and this time, make it someone you struggle with. A coworker that's been difficult, a patient that's been a stressor for staff and for you, or maybe that congregant that has a way of getting under your skin. Bring that person to mind, hold them in your heart and repeat, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be safe, May you be at peace. And now bring to mind your entire community, however you identify that. The people that are no longer there and the people that are, the people you serve. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. May we be at peace. 